Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Bo, and I have a few things to share with you as we get started. First, if you haven't done so already, grab your Bible and a notebook. We're looking forward to another great Bible message. Second, if you're new to our church, we wanna thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or you're interested in having someone pray for you, the best way to do that is to fill out the connection card. You can find the link down in the comments or on the Watch Live page there on the website. Third, even while we aren't meeting in person, the mission goes on. We want to share the hope of Jesus Christ with every person in Newton County and all around the world. Thank you for everyone who's participating with us in that through giving. And there's a few options for you to give while we are not meeting in person. The first is through online giving. Head over to the website, hit give. It's a quick process and you can give by card or bank account. Second, you can mail your check to the church, 720 Jack Neely Road. Third, you can drop off your offering on Mondays or Fridays between eight and noon. Thank you so much for being a part of our mission to get the hope of Jesus Christ to everybody. And with that, thank you once again for joining us. Let's get the service started and let's ask God to do a work in our hearts and lives. Good morning and welcome to Newton Baptist Church. It's good to have you with us this morning. We hope to be an encouragement to you and we want to ask if you would, wherever you're watching from this morning, if you join together and sing with me as we sing a couple of songs to remind us of God's grace and praise to Him for our salvation this morning. The first one, uh, we're going to sing Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. We'll sing that together, then Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Ask if you would sing it together with me this morning and praise to Him. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and in grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are This moment his grace receive grace grace God's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin grace that is greater than Redeem by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know there's a crown that is waiting in yonder bright mansion for me. And soon with the Spirit made perfect, at home with the Lord shall I be. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, 
His child and forever I am. His child and forever I am. One man said, Reconciliation without repentance is like painting over the mold on a wall. It looks good for a while on the outside, but underneath things are unchanged. Joseph wants a relationship with his brothers, but are they still the same from years ago? Open the Word of God in your hearts as Pastor Tony preaches from Genesis 44 on Truly Changed. We're so excited to have you with us today. Uh, looking forward to preaching a message called Truly Changed change truly change one thing that you can do to help us today is if you would go ahead and push the like button and that's going to be by faith uh, hopefully you've liked the singing i pray that you'll like the message but also the share button and this is just our way at, uh, as a church to be able to sort of hand out a track and uh, get other people involved in the services so if you'll do that it would be a great great help now going to the message have you ever had fantasies of revenge fantasies of revenge somebody has done something to you or some Somebody has uh, hurt you and you want to get even. I had a Baptist deacon a long time ago. Uh, we were talking about this kind of thing and he's like, hey, understand this. I don't get even. That's right. You finished it. He said, I get ahead. And so have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about uh, something that uh, you could do and you plot it out in your mind and you even go through the words with your mouth? And you're like, boy, I could really get even with somebody. I could really, really get some sweet revenge. Well, when we look at the story of Joseph, and that's where we are as we're going through the book of Genesis, you look at the story of Joseph, and Joseph has gone through just some incredibly challenging things. Um, he goes to check on his brothers at his father's command, and they accuse him of being a spy. And they have just such resentment towards Joseph, and it's because of the father's favoritism that he showed to Joseph. And so they, they see him coming one day, and they go, Oh, behold, the dreamer cometh. And they plot and plan, throw him into a pit, they sell him into slavery. He's purchased by a guy, guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife, well, she lies about him. And he ends up in prison. While he's in prison, there's a butler and there's a baker that have dreams. Now, nobody can tell them what these dreams mean. But here comes Joseph. And Joseph tells them what their dreams mean. And the baker, well, he's going to die. And the butler was going to be restored. And all Joseph asked was, hey, 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 uh, butler, remember me. Just remember me. And he was forgotten. And so he's hated by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit. He's sold into slavery. He's purchased in, by, by Potiphar. He's lied about by Potiphar's wife. He's thrown into prison. <sighs> And while he's in prison, he interprets the dreams, and then he's forgotten. And after two full years, finally he gets to a point in place that he interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And there's going to be seven good years of bounty, and then seven years of an incredible famine. The famine's going to be so bad that it's going to eat up the bounty. And so now we've got the world coming to Egypt and Joseph because they need sustenance. They need, they need stuff to be able to live on. And so when the brothers come, they don't recognize Joseph, but you got it. Joseph recognizes recognize them. And Joseph does several things when they come to him. He accuses them, sound familiar? He accuses them of being spies. And then he takes and he locks them up. And then he goes and he says, you know, how's your father? You got a brother? And he finds out uh, and they tell him about Benjamin. And so he says, I'll tell you what, one of you is going to stay in prison and the rest of you are going to go back home. Don't come back unless you bring Benjamin with you. And so they wait a while, and the dad wouldn't let Benjamin, the youngest son, go. Finally, the dad says, okay, we're going to starve to death. Let's, 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 let's send you back. Take Benjamin with you. And uh, so we get the story here. They come back. Joseph knows who they are. Joseph sees them, and uh, he brings them home, and he feeds them just an incredible meal. And one of the peculiar things he does is he gives Benjamin five times as much as he gave the rest of the boys. He had them sit according to their birthright, the birth order, and he gave to Benjamin five times as much as he gave to them. And then he sends them on his way. He puts the money back in their sacks again, and he takes his special silver cup. Up, 
and he puts it into the satchel of Benjamin. And as he sends them on their way, they get out of Egypt a little ways. The steward of Joseph's house is going to catch up with them and say, Hey, listen, has my master treated you so well and you've stolen from him? And uh, they say, Hey, we've not stolen from you. And whomever sack you would find this silver cup that you say is stolen, they, they can be your servant forever. And they didn't know that Joseph had had that silver cup placed into Benjamin's sack. And so all of a sudden it's found. It's found in Benjamin's sack. And they all are heading back uh, to Joseph. And Joseph stands before them. And we're going to pick up there with Genesis chapter 44. And I'm just going to read the whole chapter with you. And you may be looking at this story going, Wait, Joseph is setting them up. Joseph is going to be getting revenge. Joseph is retaliating. Man, look how Joseph is plotting each of this to bring their demise. And by the time the message is over, I, I would pray that God would help me to show you I don't think this is about revenge. I don't think this is about retaliation. Uh, At any point in time, Joseph could have brought down great thunder upon these brothers. He could have had them killed and executed the first go-round. I mean, Joseph has this incredible power. And so I don't think the story is about revenge. I don't think the story is about retaliation. I do think the story is about repentance and seeing where the boys truly, the brothers truly changed from their old ways. Genesis 44, verse 1, And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, This is Joseph, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry. This is after the meal, and he's given Benjamin five times as much. And put every man's money in his sack's mouth. And put my cup, now notice the plan here, And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away. They and their asses or their donkeys. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when Joseph, uh, up, follow the men. Uh, and, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Verse 5, Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth. Uh, ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouth we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house, silver or gold. They're like, this is preposterous. There's no way we would do this. Verse 9. With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, talking about the silver cup, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Now notice how this is progressing. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in the youngest one's sack, Benjamin's sack. Then notice their response. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass or donkey and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground. Notice the humility there. And Joseph saith, saith unto them, What deed? Is this that you have done? Want ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Don't you know that I have great discernment and know what's going on? Judah said in verse 16, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Now notice, this is very important. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he should be my servant. And as for you, get ye up in peace unto your father. Notice how Joseph is laying out to see what is really going on in their life. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. He's acknowledging the power that Joseph has. Verse 19, My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother, Joseph is who they're referring to there, is dead. The younger one is Benjamin. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. Benjamin can't leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. 
And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except your younger, youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, verse 24, When we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, Now, Father, we cannot go down if our youngest brother be, is, is not with us. Uh, then we will go down if he's with us. For we may not see the man's face, Joseph's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons, that's Benjamin and Joseph, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I, say, see, I, and I saw him not since, that's Joseph. They had told the father that Joseph had been killed by wild beasts and brought his clothes to his father. So his father thinks that Joseph is killed by wild, wild beasts. And if you take verse 29, this also from me, and mischief befall him, Benjamin, if something happens to Benjamin... You shall surely bring down my gray's hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, Joseph sees that Benjamin is not with him, that he will die, and thy servant shall bring down the gray's hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. Excuse me. If we go back and Benjamin's not with us, it's going to kill our dad. Notice, notice how the, now Benjamin has been given five times as much as them. Notice the change in these brothers. And he says, For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, now notice this, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide. Instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. Let me trade places with Benjamin. And let the lad go up uh, with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father. Notice the difference in the spirit. Notice the difference in the perception and the actions of these brothers. Notice the difference in Judah. Notice what's going on. And, and I believe that Joseph laid out these things to see what was really going on in the hearts of the, of the brothers. See, we, we can give people what they want to see on the outside, but man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the, that's right, on the heart. One man said this, he said, Reconciliation without repentance is like painting over the mold on a wall. It looks good for a while on the outside, but underneath things are un. Change. And if you've ever had to cover um, a water, uh, water spill or uh, mold or a stain, you know, what's that, kill Z or kills, uh, we try to put over it because we want to hide the stain. We want to hide the stain. Joseph is taking all the coverings off and he's seeing what is really at the root of these brothers in their hearts. See, repentance goes to the root of things. Um, you look and you see John the Baptist. Can you hear John the Baptist there in, in uh, Judea? He's saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye, repent ye. Can you hear Peter uh, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, where he, uh, Peter says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. I mean, repent, repent. Repentance is all through the Bible. And uh, we, may, we may think, you know, what is repentance? What is repentance? And it comes from a word and not to, to get uh, offline or, or too deep, but it's a really neat word and it, it's a, the word metanoia and meta means a change m-e-t-a means a change and then n-o-i-a means a, a, a meaning mind it means mind so it's a change of mind a turning of how you think about things and how you respond to things and how you act uh, one man said repentance as Christ preached it, as a changing of the mind, the intellect, the values that inevitably produces a profound change of the heart and emotions, a total radical transformation from seeking to please self to seeking to please God. Repentance leads to, and I just like the way this was worded, repentance leads to nothing less than a human revolution. That there's a revolting of my way and my sin and living for myself and a turning towards God, going from a denying Jesus Christ to faith and belief in Jesus Christ. Repent, turn, a change of mind which will lead to a change of action within our life. The problem that Joseph seems to be very well aware of is that there can be an outward appearance 
without inward repentance. And so we look and we see false repentance in, in a lot of people's lives. We see false repentance is something that would maybe they would be very emotional about. Maybe they would show strong emotion. Esau uh, repented with tears. Uh, he was sorrowful with tears, but it wasn't true repentance. Um, people can feel sorry, one man said, for what they have done, but why are they sorry? And so we start probing our heart and looking within our hearts and lives. Uh, we're sorry. People are sorry for their sin. Uh, are they sorry for their sin? Are they sorry for the shame they felt? Are, are, are we sorry for the sin? Are we sorry we got caught? Where's the true sorrow at? Uh, one of the unfortunate things over the years that I have had to deal with is abusive spouse. Uh, I'll just take for an example an, an abusive husband. And I've had him sitting there in my office and trying to deal with just a chaotic mess. And there with tears, the man's like, oh, baby, I'm sorry. Oh, baby, I'll never do it again. Oh, baby, I love you so much. And, and you know, t- with, literally with tears. Um, only, only, only to not really be repentant, not to really change. Sorry that he's in the pastor's office. Sorry that his wife is making him get help. Sorry for those type of things, but not really sorry within his heart and within his mind that uh, he's done wrong, that he uh, is a violent man, that he is an uncontrolled man, that he is an intemperate man, that he is an abusive man. They want to uh, show sorry and I'll never do it again, but they're not truly repentant. A drunk driver is sorry that someone is injured or even that someone got killed. Uh, but it is, for the beh- is it for their behavior or is it they sorry for facing adverse consequences? Oh, I'm so sorry that I was driving drunk and I killed so-and-so. Only to have three years later, four years later, once the jail sentence or somebody got them out of any type of penalty, only to have them do it all over again. A thief is sorry that he is arrested, but... Uh, may only be sorry for getting caught. Um, promiscuous person is uh, only sorry because of uh, something that they may have contracted. Gossip is sorry that things got out of control, but uh, you know the problem is others and not really themselves, and they'll keep on gossiping over and over again. We, we feel sorry for the consequences, but we don't feel sorry for the sin. And so we start probing and looking within our hearts and lives. Are we sorry for what we have done or why we've done it? And who we've done it to. And not just those around us, but to the God of heaven. Uh, Maybe an illustration that would show false repentance. Uh, If you have more than one child. If you have more than one child, and even if you have one child, they're going to fight with themselves. But if you've got several children in the home, uh, have you ever seen them get in a fight? You ever seen them get in a fight? Uh, Have you ever taken the two by the wrist and brought them together and say, uh, all right, you know what you did was wrong. Now, Now, say I'm sorry. And they just bo- both look at each other and like, man, I ain't saying anything. And you're like, ah, I said, say you're sorry. And, uh, you know, if you don't say you're sorry, you're grounded. You're going to lose. Um, and Nintendo shows how old I am. I'm not sure what the new gaming system is, but there you go. Uh, but you won't be able to play video games. You're not going to be able to go outside. You think quarantine bad? Wait till the wrath of mama comes down. Wait till the wrath of daddy comes down. And say you're sorry. And shake hands, right? And uh, say, so, you know, do like this. I'm sorry. Now, let me ask you a question. Are they really sorry? <laughs> are they really sorry? That's right. They're not, are they? Now, if we could take it from a silly illustration with children, the Word of God is preached, and the preacher preaches, and the truth is given, and it's almost like God, the Holy Spirit, is saying, say you're sorry. And it's not like a parent, but follow the illustration. And we're like, okay, well, I've, okay, I've gotten called. Sorry, Lord. Is that true repentance? There's a guy named Mickey Cohen. And uh, Mickey Cohen was a gangster. He was infamous Um, after the post-war era. um, People were talking to him. Preachers were talking to him. And uh, one night, you know, he was showing some interest. And they're like, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, Jesus says at the door and knocks, open up your heart's door. Uh, You need to receive Christ as your Savior. And you need to pray this prayer. And um, sometimes we call it the sinner's prayer. And the neat, unique thing about the, the story is that, um, you know, he, he consented. He consented that night. But as time went on and months passed, um, there was no change in his life. 
And all of a sudden, if I could read from the story, when confronted about repentance and no change in his life by one very bold person, uh, when confronted, he responded that no one had ever told him he would have to give up his work and his friends. After all, what, there are Christian football players, there's Christian cowboys, there were Christian politicians. Can't they be Christian gangsters? And uh, it was at this time when he was confronted about changing his life. And, and again, I want to be very careful. I know it's a fine line. I, I, it's not about work salvation. It's about faith and trust in Jesus Christ and our Savior. But when there is acknowledgement of our Savior, we realize we need a Savior because we realize the penalty of our sin. And so there should be a salvation and a change in our life that comes from that salvation. But there had never been anything like this. And when he talked about, you know, wait a minute, you, I, I might need to change my friends. I might need to change my lifestyle. From that day forward, he announced that he wanted nothing to do with Christianity. See, I believe that if we're not careful, we have impressed people to, all right, tell God you're sorry. And we, we, we're, like the, we're like two seven-year-olds, sorry, and we're shaking God's hand. And beloved, that's not true repentance. It's possible to find the gospel of Jesus Christ incredibly alluring and desirable for just a number of reasons. Uh, because the promise of forgiveness of sin. Notice the advantage there. Uh, the hope of life after death. The, the advantage there. Uh, blessings and peace in this life. Well, look at the advantages there. Uh, it will help you fit into a group of people uh, that you can find acceptance with. Well, look at the advantages there. But the person who comes to Christ for any of these reasons is that true repentance and is it true salvation? Is it real? Is it real? We've got to be so careful. Uh, I mean, these are fine lines, I know, but we've got to be so careful of getting into the, the Christian things for the advantages of what we can get out of it. Now, are there advantages? Absolutely. But there's a little concern within my heart and life that there's not true repentance, there's not true understanding that we've sinned against a holy God, and that's why we need a Savior. And yes, these are advantages of forgiveness and relationship. Oh, they're beautiful advantages, but if some people are like the seven-year-old that they're going to, okay, I shake God's hand and I'm sorry because the consequences or the advantages that follow don't want to go to hell. Um, don't, want, don't want to be, uh, go through pain, don't want to go be through suffering. You know, there, there's a false repentance. You know that um, in the Bible, several people, you know Pharaoh, uh, you know, he never, never had a heart to turn to God, uh, never had a heart to, to want to be able to serve God. He had already chosen his path, and when it says God hardened his heart, God was just adding to Pharaoh what Pharaoh had already done himself. And so all of a sudden, we look, that Pharaoh says, I have sinned. <laughs> Wait a minute. Was he truly repentant? Let me give you another guy. Uh, remember a guy named Judas, the one that kissed Jesus? The one that betrayed Jesus? You know, Ju Judas said, I've sinned. I, I, I have betrayed the innocent blood. See, there, there can be an emotion. There can be a sorrow without repentance. Truly turning and changing. Remember the change of mind? Change of how I view my sin? Change of how I view the Savior? Change of how I view Jesus Christ? That God's working within our hearts and life? False repentance. What about true repentance? True repentance, I think the brothers of Joseph, uh, as we look and as we close, I think the brothers of Joseph will show us some aspects of what true repentance is all about. And so look with me. They acknowledge their guilt. Remember verse 16? In chapter 44, verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Now, they'd not stolen the club, cup. They'd not done anything wrong. This was not dealing with the cup, in my opinion. I think Judah is going back to, you know what, this takes us all the way back to Joseph. This takes us all the way back to what we did to Joseph and the guilt of how they had treated Joseph. Um, Ju 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 Judah is confessing something from years and years ago. See, showing what's truly within their heart. Judah is confessing past sin. No, no more excuses. No more rationalizing. Notice the wording there. God hath found out the iniquity of thy, thy brothers. Remember he said earlier, uh, truly or verily, verily we are guilty concerning our sin. See, true repentance will acknowledge sin. It will acknowledge our guilt. Have you ever been found guilty before God? Maybe nobody was around, but your heart, guilty before God. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. It's acknowledging of guilt, real sorrow. 
uh, verse 13, they rent their clothes. That, that was a, t- a sign of incredible sorrow. Now, did some people do it for show? Yes. But notice there's no show here. There's nobody. Joseph's not here. They, they rent their clothes. They're, they're showing incredible sorrow. I, I think this is so much more than them putting on a show. I think this is showing the contrition and the acknowledgement within their heart and life. They, 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 they were truly, they, they had changed. They had repented. They were found guilty with what they've done. Repentance requires sorrow for sin. It acknowledges that uh, it involves sorrow that we've offended a holy God. You know, we ask, we ask, you know, how does this group feel about this? And how does this group feel about this? And it almost gets to be, it almost gets to be suffocating. That we've got to worry about so many groups and how they're going to view uh, a word that we say or an action that we do. And boy, you know, if you do that, you're going to offend this one. If you do that, you're going to offend this one. And it just gets to be burnout. Let me ask you a question. In all the groups that we're worried about how they're going to perceive or respond or take something that is said or done, have we ever thought about how, how it offends God? Have we thought about how God is affected by our actions? How God is affected by our words? How God is affected by our sin? Have, have, has that ever hurt, uh, entered within our hearts and within our lives? What does God think about all this? Sorrow for... Uh, the barrier that we've erected between us and our God, that our sin has separated us from our God? Have we ever thought about how it affects God? Humility? Oh, my soul. Such a uh, humanity, Tony. is so pompous. Uh, where's humility? Where is brokenness? They come back to Joseph and they're falling on their fa- face. They, uh, you know, understand that, wow, this is incredibly serious. Um, they show us a, a humility. They show us a brokenness. They show us a sorrow. Um, you know, we so many times we'll give people what they want to see. But again, God's looking on the inside. Is there a false repentance in our life? Is there a false facade in our life of showing people we want, to, want them to see, but who we really are on the inside? Uh, has not seen, but God sees it. And we understand we've sinned against a holy God. We understand that we've grieved a holy God. We realize we've gone against what God has said within His Word. And, and there, there is true sorrow. There is true guilt. There is true actions of turning from those things. We have a change of mind toward our sin, of how we see our sin, and how it affects our Savior and our God. And we turn from those things to our God in heaven. See, genuine change within our life. The prophet Ezekiel put it like this. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Notice the action. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? You know, true repentance. Uh, George Washington, you know, was known for chopping down the cherry tree. In old-time cartoons, there was one that had, you know, him beside yet another cherry tree. And uh, he, you know, could not lie. And he told his dad, I cut down the cherry tree. I cut down the cherry tree. I cut down the cherry tree. And, it, it, you know, it's cherry tree after cherry tree after cherry tree. You know, was George Washington honest? And this is a cartoon. Was George Washington honest? Yes. Father, I cut down the cherry tree. Father, I cut down the cherry tree. I mean, cherry tree after after cherry tree, after cherry tree. And if you say that three times, good luck. But he cut them down, and he cut them down, and he cut them down. And every time he said to his father, I cut down the cherry tree. And his father looked at him one day and said, all right, you admit it, you admit it. But tell me this, when are you going to stop cutting down the cherry trees? I did it, I did it, I did it. Well, when are you going to stop? When are you going to stop? A change of mind. Letting God work. The brothers have acknowledged their guilt. They've pled for mercy. They've shown that they are pursuing a new life. The brothers are uh, no longer filled with jealousy because Benjamin has received five times as much as they have. Uh, the, the brothers aren't willing to sacrifice Benjamin for themselves. As a matter of fact, they're, they're willing to now replace themselves with Benjamin. Um, the brothers uh, have just a, 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 a humble spirit, a repentant spirit, a changed spirit. They're no longer, and it's not about selfish, it's not about us, it's not about giving into favoritism, it's not about we're actually not going to hurt our father, we're going to be considerate of our father and how this might affect him. Think about, think with me now, and my time's gone, but think with me, what was it like 
and during the days of Joseph when he was a young man towards this day almost uh, at least 20 years I believe has definitely passed in those 20 years notice the difference of these scenes see repentance brings difference Joseph was not to me was not seeking revenge by these actions he was not seeking retaliation he was not looking for their demise he was looking for who they, they really were he was looking what the change within their heart and within their life you know questions for me to ask myself uh, on what basis do I believe I'll go to heaven on what basis do I believe I'll go to heaven am I trusting my own works because it's not by the works of righteousness which we have done it's by his mercy that he has saved us and we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior there's that metanoia there's that change of mind there's that repentance of unbelief to belief and understanding I believe that I have sinned against a holy God for me we ask the question have you been saved saved from the judgment because of my sin and because I know that I have sinned and I know that there's judgment for that sin I know that there's only one place to turn and that is placed in my faith and trust in Jesus Christ I am guilty before God and I can only be made right or righteous or just or justified through Jesus Christ am I truly sorry repentant uh, grieved because of my sin am I trying to be maybe a Christian gangster this morning I'm uh, gonna gonna put the name on but there's no change and beloved friend if you can say that you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior without there being through the Holy Spirit and dwelling your life any change in your life then you need to step back and I would tell you to evaluate Paul told them in the book of Corinthians that you need to evaluate whether or not you're truly a believer and I need to do that within my life and I encourage you to do that within your life we don't get saved over and over and over again the blood of Jesus Christ once for all he died once for all we're sealed through the blood of Jesus Christ but there must be a change of mind within our lives of how we view our sin and how we view our Savior because if I don't view my sin as exceedingly sinful then why would I need a Savior and so we need to take the initial step of coming to Christ and after we come to Christ we need to keep our lives pure before the Lord turning from those things that would come between us and our Savior we need to be sensitive to what God wants to do within our hearts and within our lives and so let me close it up with this ready um, would you come this morning and would you come with sincerity okay 60 seconds come with sincerity now put your cell phone down maybe you got a game going maybe you got Facebook open at the same time could I humbly 60 seconds ready would you come with sincerity this morning and ask God in heaven to search your heart would you sincerity ask God to search your heart would you search the scriptures and fill your life with scripture and allow the word of God to speak to you? This message, I think that uh, God in heaven is trying to speak to somebody's heart. I just have no doubt about that. You're not a true believer. You're a Christian gangster, but you're not a Christian. There's never been a true turn and change in your life. Would you allow the scriptures to permeate you? Would you come with sincerity? Would you search, search the scriptures? And then would you be sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Right now, I am a believer. The Holy Spirit is a true preacher. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit right now can either, see this kind of message is going to do one or two things. Either it's going to affirm, yes, I am a child of God. Or there's going to be an unsettledness within my heart and life. That unsettledness is conviction. If there's unrest within your heart and life, maybe that's the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit saying to you, you must be born again. There needs to be a regeneration in your life, a true change in your life as you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, understanding your sin, turning from your sin, and placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're a believer this morning. And there's something that God's dealing with you about, the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about. It's not a matter that you got caught. It's not a matter that it's known. It's a matter that God is placing His finger on your life and saying, Hey, Tony, would you change your mind of how you see that? Because, Tony, how you see it and how I see it is not the same. And as a believer, we want to see things the way God 
sees those things. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, Father? We love you. We pray that you would deepen and strengthen that love as we turn from the world and turn to you. Lord, the model of Joseph's brothers and the work that you did within their lives is amazing. And Father, we thank you that it's amazing the work you do in our lives today. It's not a thing of the past, it's a thing of today. And Father, there are those that are listening, watching by way of live stream today, that Father, you're working in their hearts and their lives. There very possibly could be somebody that does not know for sure that heaven is where they're going to spend their eternity. Instead of this message about repentance and true change bringing comfort, it's brought conviction, it's brought unrest, it's brought an uneasiness. And Father, I pray that uh, maybe they would, it's not about a prayer, it's a, a change of mind, the metanoia, Lord, our turning from sin to you and seeing you as our Savior. Father, maybe they would pray something along this line as they're having a change of mind and heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned and I see my sin as exceedingly sinful today. I'm guilty before a holy God. And there's only one way for me to be made right or righteous, and that is through what Jesus Christ has done. Today, I place my faith and trust in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I do not place it in my works and what I have done. I place it totally in what Jesus Christ has done. Change me, O Lord. Work within my heart and within my life. Father, I pray that uh, you would take each and every one that maybe would pray that prayer that never has placed their faith and trust in Christ. And it's not about praying a prayer. And the prayer is just a manifestation of what's going on in the heart. And I pray, Father in heaven, that you work deeply within people's hearts and lives. We love you and ask all this in Jesus' name. If you made a decision today, maybe you would just type on the comments, uh, send your email address because one of the things, whether it's through virtual or in our live services here in the auditorium, is when people make decisions for Christ, we try not to ever leave them by themselves. We want to help them to take the next step. And maybe today you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you would just say, please contact me and give us a way of contacting you. Because we want to help you not to intrude into your life, but to help you to take the next steps in your faith and trust and growth and grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a believer today and you're like, there's something I, I, I need to turn from or I turned from it today. I made that decision. Uh, you're a believer and maybe you wouldn't want to put out there um, what's going on in your life, but you would just as a believer say, pray for me, pray for me and give us an opportunity to pray for you. And if you'd like for us to contact you and pray for you, then you would leave us with that information. May God truly change our life and may that change be so real that other people can see God at work. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. May God bless each and every one of you.